Um, I just want to do a short um, introduction. Um, Luchi LA uh, and uh, Forrest Munger, who will be presenting the first presentation, uh, the first talk. Um, Lucia L.A. is an architectural historian and design critic who works on the intersection of culture, politics, and technology in the modern period, with a special focus on international institutions and global practices in the 20th century. L.A. taught at Princeton for 10 years, first as assistant, as assistant and then as associate professor in um, history and theory of architecture. As of September 2019, LA is Associate Professor of Architecture at Columbia University's Graduate School of Design, Graduate School of Architecture, um, Planning and Preservation. She is widely published, including her recent book, Design of Destruction, The Making of International Monuments in the 20th Century from the University of Chicago Press. Dr. Forrest Munger came to Princeton jointly appointed in the School of Architecture and the new Adeline Center for Energy and Environment. He was previously in Singapore as assistant professor in the Department of Architecture at the National University of Singapore, where he had traveled initially as a senior researcher and research module coordinator in the Singapore ETH Center's Future Cities Laboratory. He has degrees from mechanical engineering, environmental engineering, and architecture, his fields of knowledge includes building systems design in, and integration, sus sustainable systems, renewable energy, optimization of energy systems, existential analysis, geothermals, several energy storage, low temperature hybrid solar, building material, thermodynamics, and heat transfer and heat pumps. That was a mouthful. So, yeah. Yeah, please. Thanks. And concrete. And concrete. <laughs> we don't, uh, do we need this? No. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Um, concrete, good morning. I'm Lucia, this is Forrest. Concrete today, as we know it today, is 100 years old. And before you protest that concrete has existed since Roman times, what we need is that the most recent innovation, uh, which is to have systematically inserted reinforcement into concrete, is 100 years old. And before you protest that it can't possibly exactly be 100, uh, because uh, reinforcing concrete was not invented by one person in one place at one time, uh, we've constructed this interpretation by working together as a historian and an engineer in recognition of the fact that the most significant innovation, to speak the language of this conference, the most significant innovation in the history of concrete, the one that dramatically redefined it, expanding its influence, making concrete the second most abundantly used material in the world, only second to water. This innovation also completely redefined how old concrete could be. Over the last century, while engineers were experimenting with use and applicability, and while scholars were documenting its impact on architecture, on materials and labor, the addition of steel reinforcement also secretly transformed the very nature of concrete as a historical actor and as a historical factor. The secret only trickled into the largely empirical understanding of concrete that had been built up around 50 years after it became widespread use. So our first piece of evidence is an equation that was published to Little Fanfare in 1968, which established that uh, concrete has a finite, limited life. So this equation predicts the number of years, t, that any re reinforced concrete structure under conditions of natural exposure will take to fail through what's called carbonation. Now what the equation says, right, is that all reinforced structures that are reinforced with steel have a finite life in, in, implicitly because they are in contact with the atmosphere and the atmosphere has, do we have a pointer? The atmosphere has CO2 in it. And so there's a driving force of CO2 causing this process called carbonation. This process causes the failure of concrete, which is what we'll be talking about today. Now the variables in the equation are, um, the key ones that define the rate are the x, which is the depth of concrete above the rebar, the steel, and the porosity, which is d, which is a variable describing the tortuous pathway that the CO2 must take through the concrete, so how big the pores are in it. And these two properties of the concrete uh, define, in the end, that, that amount of time until this rebar will, will, fa will fail. So this equation describes this phenomenon um, 
how this concrete structure slowly what's called passivates um, and comes to chemical equilibrium with the atmosphere. But it also describes inevitable failure of an architectural kind, right? Carbonation transforms the chemical balance of the concrete that surrounds the steel reinforcement. And then this causes then the actual failure of oxidation causing rust, which expands the concrete, cracks and delaminates the rebar from the surrounding cement and concrete. And it can then no longer perform together as this single innovative material. Um, OK. so. Traditionally, historians and engineers have different attitudes to equations. Traditionally, historians relativize the truth claims of equations. And for engineers, equations serve as a kind of glue for research communities. They're kind of b carriers of the principles of basic science. But climate change, so here's your uh, hockey stick moment, is palpably affecting how historians and engineers talk and write. And we were just walking in the hall, and we caught a lecture in progress with no, no less than three hockey stick curves being projected. Um, historians cool. are increasingly feeling an urge to quantify historical time in order to make legible what they call the Anthropocene, a new era in Earth's history where natural phenomena are not just backdrops for human action, but rather where human and non-human events are profoundly affecting one another. And in the face of this new dynamic, historians are increasingly interrupting their stories to resort to science sometimes delivering fairly cogent explanations of scientific phenomena in order to write a new kind of history. Um, researchers in science and technology are also increasingly using history to describe their motivations. It's not unusual for new research in concrete and in other fields to begin by saying that my research fits into the fact that concrete began millennia ago or that uh, concrete is the most abundant anthropogenic sedimentary rock on the planet, so that every detailed incremental result is factored into this global and millennial picture of energy. So in this context, what does our equation tell us about reinforced concrete? First of all, by telling us that reinforced concrete is mortal, the equation challenges a century's worth of architectural myth-making about concrete. Uh, about concrete as permanent as stone, an emblem of modern scientific rationality dominating the features of uh, the, the forces of nature. And furthermore, by plugging into this equation the standard specification for concrete construction today, we can estimate that it will take about 100 years for most reinforced concrete structures around the world to fail through carbonation. It's not an exact number, as you'll hear, but it's a surprisingly reliable and determinant outcome. So putting these two findings together, we have a remarkable coincidence that reinforced concrete is 100 years old, and it takes about 100 years for reinforced concrete to die. So picture this. A moving wall of physical um, failure is raking through the built environment, ensuring that much of what is built today, uh, buildings, roads, infrastructure, uh, is certain to fail in no more than a century. But this fundamental problem with the finite material life of reinforced concrete barely appears in conversations about future concrete research. It is not because the science hasn't, hasn't been known. The carbonation equation was first proposed all the way back in 1928, albeit only in Japanese, by a team from the University of Tokyo based on experiments that began in 1907. This formula was refined and verified over many decades and then eventually published in English by Minoru Hamada in 1968, leading to this seminal review subsequently of the formula's literature and impacts by a Swedish researcher, Kiosti Tutti, in 1982. But the subsequent rethinking of concrete's lifespan never followed. So in our research, we use the carbonation of concrete to help rethink technical causality in the Anthropocene more broadly, and the way we consider time scales across different fields of research more contextually. All right, so let's just begin with the fact that neither figure that I mentioned is exactly 100. Um, architectural historians all agree that one of the most important factors to the triumph of concrete was that it requires little exactitude. The early history of reinforced concrete is filled with approximation, trial and error, and theories that trail behind empirical findings. The new material emerged simultaneously from a widespread network of actors, amateurs, and engineers. Gradually, standards emerged, and by 1910, an industry was born. And more than any other material, concrete was a veritable kind of liquid stone that competed with nature itself. So just to remind us, here is one of the great champions of concrete. From slender iron rods, cement, sand, and gravel, from an aggregate body, vast buildings, complexes can suddenly crystallize into single stone monoliths. 
like, previously, like no other previously known material. And Conquest novelty was announced with incredible amounts of historical hubris, as you've heard, and it turns out that this hubris was measured in centuries. Indeed, the birth of concrete was completely bound up in the centennial fever that uh, motivated international events like the World's Fair, or like the International Expo in 1900, where the Ennebeek system got the top prize for the best innovation. The obsession with the century as a historical unit had started a century before that. The idea that history progresses in arbitrarily numbered multiples of 100, that's something that was invented after the French Revolution when to kind of clean up history writing from more messy periodization like kings and generations. So in order to be secular, um, you could quantify time by centuries. Um, and the round figure of 100 was especially useful because it seemed metrical. And yet paradoxically, precisely because concrete was this kind of authorless secular material, concrete engineers operated in the kind of perpetual now. So early advances in concrete technologies were measured in extremely short increments. This first patent for the Ennebeek system, which won the Innovation Prize in 1900 at the Centennial Exhibition, expired in seven years. Auguste Perret, who built this building, one of the sort of canonical slender uh, buildings, was refused a mortgage of 40 years because the bankers took the visual ap appearance as enough evidence that it would surely collapse before 40 years. Um, a 1911 source put the lifespan of concrete at 70 to 90 years. In Italy, a lifespan of 70 years was used as early as 1935. And once reinforced concrete became um, more used for infrastructure, the number 100 was more commonly used, not because it, was, it would be acceptable for a uh, structure to collapse after 100 years, but because it was assumed that within 100 years you would be able to do maintenance and replacement of any parts. Okay. Now, what they didn't realize about that maintenance was that all structures, including ones that have undergone maintenance, continue and were before continuously subjected to carbonation. So how does this carbonation equation then fit into all of this history? So systematic failure of reinforcement was noticed already in the teens. Concrete cracked and failed faster where steel rebar was placed closer to the surface of concrete. So we knew already the depth mattered. 1917, Italian researchers correctly described this process and the relationship to depth. It was also noted that the proximity to seawater would increase the rate of failure due to the chlorides from salt. So we already knew it had to do with oxidation. And this evidence was quickly translated to imply how those relationships related to these chemicals in the environment. And chemists also had a very good sense of the relationship in the equation where T equals um, uh, K to X squared, right? This X squared component is related to the basic law of Fick's law, which was defined in 1895, according to which any medium, say air, which has a high concentration of a substance, wants to come to equilibrium by diffusion through adjoining media. And so this rate was understood to be driving this process. So we understood a lot about what was going on. Now, what Humada and Uchida in Tokyo finally described in 1928, but only in Japanese, was the missing piece to all of this evidence and science, which was what is the thing that's actually diffusing, and what does that, how does that relate to our environment? So since the problem of oxidation uh, of the reinforcement um, was logically thought initially to be oxygen being transported from the outside air via rainwater or some other mechanism or just diffusion, um, in fact, it was not the oxygen diffusing. The oxygen was already sitting inside in the water. Um, it turns out that the cement binder in concrete, that magical little component that turns from liquid to solid forms, right, um, had been given this new task inside the, the concrete. So when you have this cement binder, it is initially at a very high pH. And this is the key component to this whole process, right? The cement adjacent to the rebar is at such a high pH that this passivation, the passivation passivates the oxidation of the rebar, prevents rust from happening, right? And so what carbonation does, and what Hamada realized in Japan, was that uh, Hamada understood before anybody else that it was this other reaction, the secondary reaction of carbonation within the concrete that eventually lowers the pH and cancels out the passivation and then allows the oxidation to occur. So correlating his observations with the depth of carbonation during different time periods, uh, Hamana produced this equation that demonstrated a universal finite life of reinforced concrete. And by 1968, he recognized that while the original form of his equation was correct, um, K, this factor, varied highly depending on the different types of concrete um, as 
porosities and depths vary through different uh, deployments. Can we talk about the, um, the purple and, color? Yes, and so in one thing that has carried on throughout history, these are samples from today, and even back when Hamada was doing this, carbonation and can be observed just by doing simple pH measurements. So the pink measurement is a standard mechanism of measuring the pH in the concrete. Um, and if you look at animations, like we commonly do in, in, in concrete analysis, you will see how um, and why the observed uh, carbonation lifespans end up ranging so widely, actually, on either side of our predicted 100 years. Because the speed of the reinforcement of the reinforced concrete's decay is not directly linearly proportional to time, right? It, it takes longer and longer to get deeper and deeper into the concrete. So it, it's easy for it to take anywhere. Uh, it could take from 80 years for carbonation to get almost all the way to the rebar, or it could take 100 years to get the same depth with a very little variation in the concrete's uh, properties. Should I play it again? So this wide range, right? Yeah. So the beginning, it goes very fast. And then this, these last sections, because of fixed law, makes the diffusion take place uh, slower, and it creates a wider variation. So uh, this just confirms that, indeed, the equation is deterministic, and it's setting a fate for concrete. But 100 years just tends to be the number that is the most indicative of its lifespan. <laughs> Um, all right, so why did carbonation, this finding, uh, remain so marginal after it was discovered? And it's especially surprising that no big revelation followed the publication of the carbonation equation because it came at a moment of rising environmental awareness, 1969, 1982. Um, here's the other hockey stick curve. Oh, this is, sorry, that's the hockey stick curve. That's the phases of carbonation. And this is the other hockey stick curve that are deeply uh, concerned with. These two phenomena, these two curves are related. So just as a reminder, the CO2 in the atmosphere that is diffusing into concrete's pores is the same CO2 whose concentration is in the atmosphere has risen to just above 400 parts per million to 300 parts per million that it was a century ago. So the concrete construction industry, this is for you, contributes approximately 5 to 8 percent of the anthropogenic CO2 emissions. And the anthropogenic nature of concrete's formation, which is causing its failure, also is being changed by the concentration of CO2 in the air. So in this sense, what we're saying is that concrete propagates its own failure. And yet correlating these two hockey sticks historically is very difficult. Uh, our 100 years don't fit very well within the three phases that are supposed to divide this hockey stick. It's supposed to be that there was a beginning of the Anthropocene in the Industrial Revolution, 1800. And then there was a great acceleration around 1945, and then a kind of point of no return around 2000. Um, so carbonation research, as you've just heard, was an integral component of concrete research in the 20th century, uh, with the period from 1907 to 1902 actually seeing gradual incremental research findings. Um, but the story is slightly different, and there are also three phases. So I know we have almost out of time, but I'll go quickly. Um, the first phase, in the first phase, the research dynamics went exclusively from site to lab. Hamada's work began as a research assistant to Toshika Tasano, who, like many other architect engineers, traveled to San Francisco in 1906 to witness the effects of the earthquake on reinforced concrete. He returned to Tokyo, produced a whole set of material samples, and it was those samples that Hamada used in his 1928 paper. In fact, Hamada was undeniably one of the most versatile, internationally connected, and accomplished concrete researchers he would be at this conference today. He would be like an A-lister. But he was also involved in many other kinds of testing, not just carbonation. His goals were to include safety in earthquake, fire, war, against salinity for use in national building standards, and to encourage trade and commercial export. So he was involved in architectural education. He built a chamber in his architecture school devoted entirely to pumping CO2 into concrete. And when he finally published his findings in English, he was at the end of this kind of um, phase of industrializing and institutionalizing concrete research. The second phase begins when his findings are published in English and they're transported into Sweden. This time it's the whole territory that's conceived as a laboratory, a kind of full-scale mock-up. Tutti conducts no new experiments for his dissertation. He just feeds Hamada's equation with samples of buildings that had been built since the 1930s in Sweden as a kind of massive experiment in modernist building. Um, 
Although his insights confirmed the fragility of concrete, the myth of concrete as a monolithic material suitable for an entire country survives, and not just in Sweden, but basically everywhere. The third phase begins when the carbonation research that has then been confirmed by Tutti is brought into the emerging discipline of material science. So material science engineering became an autonomous field growing out of metallurgy in the 60s and 70s. It was an innovation-driven discipline. It worked by transferring the properties of one material onto others. You could even say that material science was invented to, cre uh, to kind of host and, and probabilize equations like Hamada's, um, to probabilize molecular behaviors and make new materials, not deal with existing materials like concrete. So as soon as the carbonation equation became widely accepted, it was taken out of the architectural, out of the experimental, the territorial, and into a science that segments innovation into highly specific domains, the chemistry part, the physics part, the computational part. Mm -hmm. But it is this detailed understanding of the internal workings of concrete and the related 100 years that are now situated in the Anthropocene that can motivate shifts in historical perspective and drive necessary innovation. In this third phase of ine inevitable no return, we have the detailed science that shows that CO2 is driving climate change and it is also driving an inevitable failure of concrete. Both these processes register across the time frame of 100 years, yet at that pace, we might think of the analogy of the frog slowly heated up in the pot of water that never jumps out and then is left to die boiling, whereas we as humans, I would hope, are slightly smarter than frogs um, and have here in this room both historical and technical knowledge that should inform us to take action. So it's with this mentality as we close and begin the conference today um, that we suggest we all take this as a precedent and think about how the innovations presented can be better motivated by considering all of these temporal dynamics that surround concrete. As we discuss labor and industrialization, we have to recognize how concrete's use ubiquitously in housing may not necessarily matter for long lifespans, but certainly drives the huge use of concrete and the emissions. We must also consider how innovation um, that, that changes the, the dynamics of how carbonation and the relationship between lifespan and resiliency, as we try and build resilient structures, we must recognize those time limits. And then finally, as we discover new ways to create better forms and minimize material use, we have to continually understand how material science of concrete can inform both these lifespans in terms of carbonation, but also whether alternative production pathways might lead to redu a reduction of the CO2 emissions that are driving that process. And so in, clo in closing, although we surely have not convinced you that concrete is 100 years old, we hope we have provided both the technical and historical material to inform our discussions on innovations in concrete today, and especially to rethink the role that research plays in an age where 100 years is not just any other number. Our next, pres our next presentation, um, are by Maria Gonzalez Pendez and Atea Corquilla. Um, Maria Gonzalez Pendez is a postdoctoral fellow at the Society of Fellows and Heyman Center in the Humanities and a lecturer in the Art History Department of Columbia University, where she also leads a new interdisciplinary initiative on public humanities. Trained as an architect and a historian, her, her teaching and research explores the intersection of spatial and building practices with processes of technological, governmental, and religious modernizations across the Spanish post-colonial world. Atea is, um, is an architectural um, historian, is an assistant professor at Columbia University GSAP, researching the infrastructure environments and ecological landscapes of the developmental Indian state with an interest in the aesthetics of construction material as a, as, such as concrete, bamboo, and plastic. Her, her current book, um, project investigates the plinth as an interface between infrastructure and architecture in developmental discourse in post-World War II India, arguing for this architectural gesture as a point where the state, the market, and foreign interests converge to produce a global third world subjectivity during the Cold War. So please welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. So we're having the slides there. <laughs> 
how do we get to our slides? How, how do we get to Is it a different? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Have to wait 140 years. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you so much. We want to start by uh, thank you, Katie and Wes, and of course, TN, for inviting us to be part of this amazing con uh, conference. And we want to start by sort of um, uh, telling you a little bit about how we're going to do this. We have taken your invitation to have a conversation very, very seriously. Uh, Atea and I are both architectural historians. We work mostly independently in our research, uh, both on mid 20th century politics of concrete. Atea in the Indian independence. I work in um, the Latin American world. Um, but again, we work independently. Uh, but today we thought that the way to state this conversation is that we exchange our work, we read each other's work, and we're going to be presenting each other's work. So I'm going to be commenting and presenting Atea's work. She's going to be presenting briefly on uh, my, my work. And then we're going to finish by bouncing a few uh, um, questions off each other. So we appreciate the little signs with the two minutes, because we'll just call it a day when the time, um, when the time is up. Um, so that's, and hopefully we can continue with the questions later in, in the Q&A. But just to say that this is a bit of an exploratory format for us uh, also. So thank you for that. And we hope that it is a legible um, format. Okay. Ah, where? This one, the big one. No? I think I like the yeah. materiality. Okay. All right. So Maria Onatea's work. From dams to, warehouse, uh, to warehouses, Atea's research turns to engineering works to cast concrete as a mode of politics, a technology and a media system crucial to the production of architectural landscapes, yes, but also crucial to the production of socioeconomic relations and political regimes. Concrete builds economies and informs technologies but it also builds societies and ideologies. In this case, the case of uh, independence India, ideologies of nationalism and economies of development. Ateya's analysis goes well beyond contextual operations um, in the traditional mode of architectural history to argue that concrete works were uh, formally determined by social and political forces just as much as by structural limits or stylistic choices. Central to the polyvalent formation of a politics of concrete, of concrete was the production of new social relations, new social values called to govern life under modernity. In Atea's work, concrete is itself a site where expertise emerged as a social value and the expert, uh, the engineer in particular, emerged as its subject. In the process, the technological, um, so that's the expert, uh, in the process, believe it or not, in the process, the technological and social relations of construction shifted, and knowledge production began to translate from the domain of the contractor on site to the domain of the engineer away from it. In this dislocation of know-how from the contractor to the engineer, uh, the engineer was called to facilitate, above all else, efficiency. Efficiency has long enjoyed a level of mantra or belief under conditions of modernity, as historian of technology Jennifer Alexander has argued, as she traces how a concept and a value that emerged within technology efficiency transferred to become a social value of quasi-religious status in the US. So efficiency has this sort of level of myth um, that informs so many claims around concrete. In India and in Mexico, the context where I work, and elsewhere across the global south, the mantra of efficiency certainly took hold during mid-century development. This is the moment where your um, um, diagram before sort of started to spike up um, with efficiency at its value. And in the global south, this was often hinged on conditions of scarcity and the idea of scarcity, a scarcity of food and of steel, for instance. So the demand was to tackle the scarcity through efficient design. With its unparalleled structural and material uh, characteristics, pr concrete proved fitting for the task. But as Ateya argues in her work, concrete and the engineer worked not only at the level of India's material infrastructures, but also, and perhaps more powerfully, at the level of the imagination, at the level of consciousness you were talking about before. Uh, that is, concrete worked and the expert worked as figures that offered the emerging nation new ideas and ways of thinking of what was possible. Ideas uh, related, um, or ideas where efficiency and flexibility were seen to solve scarcity 
through what she calls, and I quote her, an ideology of multipurpose capacity. So I want to insist on, or ask Ateya more, about the ways in which efficiency was socially construed, however much as a universal value, as a truth, how engineers and architects in particular helped invest efficiency with social and moral balance, and to what effects. For in India, as in Mexico, scarcity and efficiency pertain commodities, and some commodities like steel and sand and food, but crucially not bodies or at least not the bodies on the side, the construction workers, the bodies who were excessive in number, whose movements were not necessarily efficient, and who I suppose were the source of hunger, the hungry bodies of development, incommensurable, and at its most extreme, disposable. So these are the bodies who died during the construction of the Bakra Dam, uh, which a story Ateya tells. In his speeches, Prime Minister Nehru elevated these dead bodies to heroic figures, and also briefly in a documentary that she uses in her work. So I get that my, my question um, as to this sort of celebration of the worker as a heroic figure of development is to what extent this was a fetishization of labor in the Marxist sense, the use of the worker as a fetish, uh, a form of worshiping the worker that only hid the legal and economic conditions of production. So the subject that is not hidden uh, in, at the time uh, and in Ateya's work, so this is the heroic representation of the worker. The figure that is not hidden and comes out in full modern form is the engineer, charged with computing concrete technology. So why did they not count workers, I ask um, her? Why did not count their movements and their excess? Why not count the social excess on which efficiency relied? I don't think this is an entirely unfair question to our engineers. I don't think, since they were squarely positioned within what Ateya calls the realm of social transformation. Concrete experts at the time, during mid-century, were relentlessly called on to fulfill, and I quote, a glorious task, uh, of bringing plenty and contentment to an emerging nation and save it from famine. Claims of this kind echoed across the South where concrete and its experts were charged, priest-like, with bringing ecological, economic, and even spiritual redemption. So when it comes to concrete, the stakes, the stakes really seem to be very high. So why is concrete so very often called on to perform some form of salvation, some form of miracle, Concrete has long nurtured a magical allure, a cold value anchored in its seemingly supernatural ability to turn dust into stone and into anyone's scale and desire, as with the Bakra Dam in India. But the best of magic tricks, the best of magic requires the best of tricks, the best of crafts and uh, tools of deception. Which brings us back to the question anchoring Ateya's research and today's conversation, who produces the knowledge about the turning of dust into form, and where is this knowledge produced? Uh, questions to which uh, historians seem to uh, typically add uh, what is the cost, the social cost. One the steep cost at mid-century was the neglect towards workers. As Ateya writes, and I quote her, engineers obscure the fact that even machines needed people to operate them. In their journals, experts wrote as if the dam would be built without manual labor. So narratives around concrete at the time um, okay, so this was the image that was meant, since we were sort of crafting the images together, they're not perfectly aligned, to represent sort of the glorious task, uh, not of the concrete. Uh, images uh, or narratives around concrete at the time came in two forms. One was the technocratic language that represented concrete through numbers and drawings. Engineers both mastered and embodied the power of quantification. Uh, these numbers counted mostly things but not bodies of, or movements, in a language that excised uh, labor and maintenance in lieu of expertise and innovation. The other were the propaganda representations, no? where the workers appear heroically, yes, but also fleetingly, uh, a marker of social democracy in images that similarly glossed over the specifics of the workers. So both genres proved blind to the dynamics on site and to the social and racial relations that were at stake. The two are only seemingly paradoxical representations of labor, a dialectic 
uh, of the same project of nation building through ideals of efficiency and expertise. So where are these bodies? Uh, the body has long been excised from our understanding of concrete technologies, to use a verb that Ateya mobilizes as she calls to render labor visible in our unpacking of a politics of concrete. This is indeed an urgent call for bodies like nature, I would add, are, by res are bad resources whose extraction underscores the exploitative relations that continue to determine very real problems, that continue to determine colonization, development, and concrete technologies across the world today. The task is daring. Labor remains, um, oops, um, labor remains a glaring absence in historical and design narratives, the worker elusive in our research, which is not mere oversight, as Ateya's work shows. For the categories and the archives with which we analyze and discuss concrete architecture, categories such as efficiency, objects such as drawings and structural diagrams were meant to obscure the bodies on site to begin with. They were designed to neglect the workers' due value. A labor archive is still there for us to aggregate, if I may. Its pieces somewhere in the numerical language of the expert, the heroic uh, images of propaganda, and perhaps most ghostly, and I'm turning now to um, uh, a structure in Mexico to continue the conversation, perhaps most ghostly, these bodies are mapped onto the materiality of concrete itself, the forms by which we might make visible the bodies who carried innovation quite literally on their shoulders. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tien. Thank you, Wes. Thank you, Katie, for organizing this, just to echo Maria. Um, so I'm presenting a little piece of her work, and I will just begin. Why did one of Candela's many shells, the open Palmira church in Cuernavaca, south of Mexico, collapse in 1952? This question can be answered in many ways. Gravity, incompetence, cement shortages, design failures. The answer, in a sense, depends on the discipline to which we ask the question. Sociology, political science, structural engineering, architecture being just a few. Um, in Maria's research, she argues that we are asking the question from the wrong end. The question here is not one of thickness or concrete ratios or reinforcement diameters. Um, if we are to understand the failure of the structure, we need to understand the relationship between labor and design. The collapse of this shell is spectacular, but it conceals the many, many smaller collapses that occur on and in the bodies of workers. Um, to investigate the smaller collapses buried under this larger one, Maria turns to another set of collapses, the collapse of Cubiertas Ala, the Cadella's um, contracting firm, the firm that made shells stand but failed to pay workers insurance, and uh, led to the, that led to their foreclosure in the 1970s. What can we make of all of these collapses off and around shells that seem to promise to save architectural modernity? The promise of shells was that they substitute um, geometry for mass in their gambit for strength. So the shell is, in a sense, the opposite of the dam. Um, shells required architectural, structural, and mathematical expertise in a way that centered the architect. And here we have um, Candela, the contractor. Um, in a way that centered the architect as expert. And what is forgotten, of course, in this story is that the third world was really attempting to modernize in a condition of profound scarcity. Shells seem to promise heroic modernism, technological modernity, and material efficiency. And Maria notes that the workers for Cubiertas Ala routinely mangled hands, lost toenails, dangled from staircases as they precariously transported um, revoltura, liquid cement, um, up uh, to pour into often handmade for formwork. Ironically, it is these bodily incapacitations that triggered insurance policies, thus marking the names of um, Jose Cardenas Contreras, Jose Bautista Romera, Joaquin Adam Barales in official archives, 
And in recouping these names, Maria poses a question, how should we archive the laborers of our buildings? She frames this question in another way, which is how do we evaluate the bodies of workers? Is it only possible to catalog these bodies in terms of risk? The valuation of the body, the cost of labor, is central to decision making in how these shells were contracted and where their expertise was located. The archive of what happened to workers can only be told from the perspective of risk management. So there is this doubling of the body of the worker, necessary for making the structure, but also necessary as a guarantor of value, of the value of labor, which becomes a mechanism to account for quantified and com computed bodies in the concrete economy. So how then do we unwrap the cost of the shell? How do we evaluate the body and the, of the labor and the laborer outside of the metrics of risk and insurance? Um, Maria pose, Maria's work poses this tricky question, which is how do we extract these bodies outside of their valuation and financialization? How do we historicize them on different terms? And embedded in this historical question is a more political and urgent one, which is how do we now uh, craft an archive with a more critical and less colonial approach to the history uh, of some of, arch of architecture's most alluring materials and technologies. Can we bring labor into the history of design? In Candela's case, um, the labor involved in making detailed calculations for hypar shells, which often combined multiple geometric forms to achieve their final effect, were too tedious. Um, Let's, yeah, we can keep yeah. that for a bit. Oh, okay. We're too tedious. Um, involving calculation tables. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so these are these would be some of the tables that Candela would have probably looked at. But these are tables from shells in India. Uh, yeah. From the Bureau, Indian Bureau of Standards. Until uh, the firm purchased machines to do the math with punch cards. Often. That's the machine up there. Often, Candela only provided two elevations and a plan, an efficiency of drawing and time, um, for, uh, indicating them as enough to construct the form work for the shells on site. So shells were thus resolved and designed, we should prob properly argue, on site by unnamed laborers left out of archives whose knowledge of concrete made these shapes and forms possible at all. The resolution of the form and the form work um, took place on site, a process that uh, Maria uses Pamela Smith's phrase, artisanal epistemology, to describe. And um, these concrete shells bear the marks of laborers. Oh, we have, you can see the marks uh, of, in, in its plastic surface, stamps of wood, hooks for ladders, and traces of their making. The travesty of this industry is that it embodies risk, and it expects the worker to transact in that space of embodied risk. Shells are efficient because they outsource risk to the bodies of workers. So we see with the history of construction that there is a constant computation and extraction of value from the various processes around labor. The shells emerge out of a dialectical relationship uh, between two economic imaginaries, a performed efficiency and an embodied excess. Mm. The shell's efficiency is contingent on an excess embodied by labor. Maria makes the crucial point that the cheapness of shells, although sold as a frugality of material, was actually a, a product of the extraction of cheap labor. But there is a larger historical shift captured in this work, the history of the separation of lab and site, um, and the separation of the kinds of labor that take place in the laboratory and on site. And of course, laboratory is literally the place where we labor. Um, from the Latin word. The separation of lab and site is often told as a story of the technological division of labor, intellectual versus physical labor, the logical conclusion of, um, the, of a platonic mind-body dualism, perhaps, in, in which concrete requiring technical precision in design and also in mixing is shifted further and further away from the site. Um, but the history of concrete has a different story to tell, which is that risk, it is risk and not technology that has fueled this distancing, um, or rather risk in addition to technology that has fueled this distancing between lab and site. Um, and in that sense, my question to Maria really is a question of how do we understand where risk is located in the history of concrete and on the bodies of laborers? Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, I have the one minute, so these questions so, are going to yeah, be performative probably only. a good idea to um, um, 
elaborate on them later in our discussion. Right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so thank you for, um, welcome back to, from the break. Um, I'm going to just introduce our next presenters um, before we have a discussion for this panel. Um, Ken Hover um, began work for Dougal and Myers Construction Company in Cincinnati as an estimator, then assistant superintendent, project engineer, and project manager. After serving as a captain in the U.S. Army Combat Engineers, um, Ken joined at THP Lab um, Company, consulting engineers as a designer, spe specification writers, and eventually partner and manager. He has over 200 publications addressing various material states of concrete, and Ken is past president of ACI and member of the past chair of several ACI committees. Um, and I, I will keep the file short um, because they can be quite long. Of, Accolades. Um, Sasha Zegovic is an assistant professor at Cornell University, AAP, where he directs the Robotics Construction Laboratory, an interdisciplinary research group investigating robotic based construction technology. Um, Zygovic is a co-principal of HANA, an experimental architectural practice based in Ithaca, New York. HANA's research focuses on uh, advancing traditional building construction techniques by implementing new technologies and processes of making, addressing subjects of construction, rapid urbanization, and mass customization housing design. So join me to welcome Kent and Sasha. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Tian. Ken and I are very excited to be a part of this symposium, and we would like to thank Tian, Wes, and Jerry for the kind invitation. Our talk is titled Protecting the Public, Safeguarding the End Users of Our Art and Technology. So we'll also start at the beginning. For everyone who's been to a construction site, this image might present a familiar scenario. Shovels, buckets, construction workers, and the pouring of concrete into wooden formwork. Pictured here is the roughly 150-year-old or 100-year-old proven and largely unchanged state of the art of common concrete construction. In many respects, buildings are built the same way that they were built 100 years ago. And in many respects, perhaps until recently, building codes or standards were reflective of that condition. For everyone who's been to a lot of architecture conferences, this chart is also very familiar. The global construction industry has an efficiency and productivity problem. While other industries have adopted automation, robotics, and data processing to increase productivity, the productivity in construction has remained stagnant since 1945, and many of us predict this to change. At a fundamental level, new concrete technologies challenge the way buildings are designed and constructed. Robotics, digital fabrication, and computation enable the seemingly effortless mass customization of structures and building components. This constitutes a fundamental paradigm shift for the construction industry, architecture, and engineering. This also means that future buildings might become one-offs systems and are less likely to follow a conventional recipe of technical ingredients, material mixtures, and con construction techniques. So closing the gap between the research lab and the construction site presents a tremendous challenge due to the absence of codes and standards applicable to new building techniques. The following four case studies each address the issue of emerging standards in different ways. The first and second project I show today are deceiving. They look like 3D printed buildings, but they are in fact hybrid constructions. Corbel Cabin uses 3D printed concrete components as sacrificial formwork for conventional concrete construction. We 3D print complex geometries, or not so complex geometries, which become the containers for rebar and concrete. The rebar is custom fabricated to adjust to the interior of the 3D printed geometry, and then you pour the concrete into that. We constructed the cabin this way predominantly due to safety reasons. While it's not obvious from this image that we are safety freaks, um, we did not trust our 3D printed concrete to be structural. 
Our current process has too many variables leading to big cracks in hairline fractures, misalignments, or layer delaminations, etc. Luckily, in this structure, none of this matters. We could chisel away the 3D printed skin, and the structure would still stand and hold up. In a way, you could argue we cheated. We made what seems to be a 3D printed building, which in fact relies upon conventional concrete construction, reinforced concrete, to hold itself up. Now, to us, this still makes sense, because we save all the wooden formwork it would take to build such a structure. So there is innovation, there is advancement, albeit incremental in nature. I think it's important uh, to keep in mind that the code discussion applies to many other material systems uh, and construction techniques as well. This is a, a robotically fabricated timber skin, uh, which completes the cabin, which we finished uh, this summer. And we will only really be able to successfully transition from lab to site if we broadly address code and its legal or safety ramifications. The second project, before we built our own 3D printer at Cornell and worked on the cabin, my partner Leslie and I briefly worked with a Chinese company called Winsun, who are commercially 3D printing buildings in China. So conceptually, this is a very similar system utilizing 3D printed formwork and conventional concrete construction, uh, largely for code reasons. We developed a small structure, a factory guardhouse. The design is a play on edge conditions between right angle and fillet, because Winsun can only print straight extrusions uh, for now or maybe forever. What's interesting about this building to us is also that it's fully permitted and it suggests strategies to implement building systems during construction. In its very early stages, building industry adapts new hybrid technologies such as concrete 3D printing and reinforced concrete construction, and most importantly, it helps to establish a legal framework to deploy such projects in the real world. And that, to me, is a big achievement of, of Winsome. But what do we do when cheating or hybrid construction is not an option? The third case study is, in fact, a 3D printed and self-supporting structure uh, a small one. In 2018, HANA won the Folly Function Competition organized by the Architecture League of New York and Socrates Sculpture Park. We designed 3D printed chairs that, when rolled, enable different seating configurations for the user. We developed full-scale prototypes for the competition. This is an image of the competition, competition stage. Knowing that they will need heavy modification because the concrete that we use here for printing is largely unreinforced. It's no surprise that the unreinforced concrete can hold a lot of weight. Careful with it. But on impact, this happens. A catastrophic structural failure. Um, and that's an issue, obviously. So <laughs> our team did a series of tests to determine uh, suitable reinforcement method, and mind you, that's, this is within the short time span of a project like this. It's mostly educated guessing, because there are so many variables in 3D printing in the process itself. Layer height, material mixture, curing time, the type of fiber reinforcement, the experience of the person operating the printer. These variables all impact structural behavior, are challenging to control, can lead to structural failure, and have an impact on reinforcement strategies. In the end, we settled on another semi-hybrid construction, adding three pieces of number four custom bent steel rebar for each chair. The rebar is then embedded during the printing process, which means that some of the layers are double width, which significantly increases the weight of each chair, which makes them less user friendly. And it's a kind of semi-satisfactory result but within the short time frame of the project, it was the best possible outcome. So out of the 20 chairs deployed to the park, 13 survived one year in, in New, York, New York City with park visitor exposure and are now at display at Art Omai Sculpture Park in Ghent. So in order to implement such an experimental project, one needs a client willing to take the risk, knowing that the project is not up to any code being aware that there might be durability issues, realizing that with the right determination, um, concrete furniture can break. Uh, we did not experience catastrophic failure in the park, but um, we might have. 
for the fourth project, a work in progress, there are no shortcuts. Everything has to be invented, tested, and standardized from scratch. At RCL, we developed a method of spatial concrete printing on a substrate. And this method enables the creation of complex and structurally optimized shell geometries with uh, intricate toolpaths. So with a team of colleagues from Cornell, Ken and I are currently working on the advancement of this sub-adaptive printing method. And in order to implement the method, we will have to consider and develop standard procedures for a wide range of factors. Layer behavior, material mixtures, fabrication process, protocols, viscosity control, freeze-thaw durability, wet-dry behavior, flexure testing for different reinforcement methods, fire safety, earthquake behavior, environmental uh, performance, the list is almost endless. And so a project like this one um, really raises a couple questions for me. Can building codes adapt to the ever-accelerating innovation in the construction industry without compromising safety? In the future, will each new innovative building or structure require its own possibly expensive set of standards? Can the implementation of new building standards be accelerated? And how might architects and engineers collaborate on the development of new standards and procedures which address the emerging context of mass customization in architecture and engineering? And with these overwhelming questions, I hand this presentation over to my esteemed <laughs> colleague. Thank you very much. Uh, when you go back home and your colleagues uh, say to you, well, so what's the big deal about concrete? They're probably going to say, what's the big deal about cement anyway? You can, uh, you can tell them that uh, total global production and consumption of concrete is 12 kilograms per person per day for every single person on this planet. That translates to five and one half liters per day for every man, woman, and child on Earth. Now, my fundamental question for you right now is have you had your concrete today? <laughs> Building codes protect the public. That is their purpose. They are not bureaucratic sets of complicated rules for no reason. They are bureaucratic sets of complicated rules for the purpose of protecting the public and the, and the public that we are protecting are people who do not know what we know. They do not care what we know. They just trust us that we are putting facilities that will safeguard them into the infrastructure. And building codes, whether we like them or not, are the law. All 50 states have had their legislatures vote on adoption of building codes. All 50 states in the United States have chosen to adopt what's known as the International Building Code as their primary model code to which they add uh, uh, particular exceptions that are unique to their, uh, their region. Uh, though, as I mentioned, those, uh, all 50 states and all U.S. territories have adopted the, uh, the IBC. The IBC, in turn, has adopted the American Concrete Institute Building Code for Structural Concrete produced by ACI Committee 318 of which I have been a member since 1996. So a lot of the references here today will be to some new things which I think give us hope within the ACI uh, a building code. Now what kind of stuff will you find in a, uh, in a building code? You'll find responsibilities of the, uh, the various parties, design methodology and fundamental behavior. You will find flat out some structural mechanics inside a, uh, a building code. Mechanisms and modes of failure, mechanical property requirements and standards, durability-related uh, properties, requirements, and standards. What about serviceability, shrinkage, creep, deflection, and cracking? Fire resistance, that, uh, that actually is an entirely separate uh, edition of the International Building Code. How do we inspect? How do we sample, test, quality control, quality assurance? What about reliability? At this instant, the ACI 318 building code is looking at a 99% uh, confidence level for concrete strength. And building codes will also tell us about construction requirements and evaluating existing structures. Now, we might want to be bold and go it on our own and say we don't need building codes. And if that's the case, we need to put this sign on our innovative structures. Warning, innovative materials and construction methods were used in construction of this building. 
Long-term response to continuously or frequently applied dead or live load, cycles of wet, dry, hot, cold, freezing weather, or exposure to seawater, deicing salt, sulfates, acid rain, floods, tornadoes, hurricanes, or earthquakes has not been ascertained. There is no consensus about how to reliably design with these materials or methods. Materials and methods do not conform with state or local building codes. Enter or pass nearby at your own risk. Now, Sasha told me that I should print these and sell these, that we've got uh, people here who will buy these for your structures. If we're going to go into the code business, we need a wide range of, uh, of mechanical properties, not just compression and tension strength, but there's a whole array of, uh, of other properties that we need to know. And how will they vary with changes in our mixes and changes with our uh, installation methodology? We need to know what the vulnerability is to uh, uh, environmental degradation. We heard a, a very exciting discussion earlier about one single vector, and that being carbonation. What about alkali reactions, fire damage, chlorides, corrosion, sulfate reactions, freezing and thawing? Generally speaking, in the United States, these vectors will kill the concrete before carbonation will. What about reliability and reproducibility? Our current building codes make assumptions based on 100 years of experience on how reliable our concrete is. If we ask a concrete producer to give us 5,000 PSI concrete at 28 days, we roughly know about how closely they are going to, uh, to do that, and that's built into our codes. Do we know that with our innovative materials? We know a lot about batch to batch and within batch variation within conventional concrete, do we yet know about batch to batch and within layer variability for 3D printed concrete, for example? But as we're thinking about can we solve these problems, I say yes, ladies and gentlemen. There is hope for the concrete heart. <laughs> there are issues, and we just heard the issues, but I think there is hope. And strangely, some of the evidence for that hope comes from the most recently published version of the ACI 318 code, that is the 2019 uh, version. And what do I see in there? Because I participated in some of these. Uh, Shotcrete was adopted in the 2019 building code, acceptance of recycled aggregates, and acceptance of alternative cements. And what I want to do is tell you brief stories about those three new entrees to the building code that I think help pave the way for how we will get this innovation into the uh, other code. One could say shotcrete, which is technically known as pneumatically applied mortar. One could say this is the first in a long series of 3D printing in which it is just pneumatically uh, applied instead of hydraulically or gravity fed. Now, uh, shotcrete has been around for a very long time, but only in 2019 has it been officially recognized in the building code. And, one, and a couple of the things that really helped that adoption, this happened in one single cycle. The 2014 code was done, the 2019 code was the next one up, Shotcrete was not in 2014, was not even discussed. And in one single code cycle, Shotcrete was uh, fully embraced. But what made that possible? Pre-existence of consensus documents from industry as to what's the right way to do Shotcrete and how should architects and engineers specify Shotcrete. Those Consensus documents existed in advance of the, uh, of the building code. And it tells us about uh, uh, freezing and thawing, reinforcement, where you are allowed to use shotcrete. What about materials, proportioning and mixtures, documentation and mixtures, placement, consolidation, curing, joints, evaluation and acceptance. Those topics there would apply to 3D printing, for example. We just have to fill in the blanks and figure out what we want to say there. Another thing that made this possible is the existence of the American Shotcrete Association, a professional uh, organization in which people could get together, could discuss good practices, and allow some of the ideas to uh, start coming together. Without that, it would not have gotten into the, uh, the building code so easily. We heard that there's a shortage of sand. We heard that there is a shortage of, uh, of course, aggregate. In, uh, in the Hawaiian Islands right now, they are building concrete structures out of sand and coarse aggregate that is shipped to Hawaii from British Columbia. They used to ship it from California until California woke up and said, we've got to stop shipping our state to other places. We're going to run out of state. 
So recycled aggregate is a, is a very popular idea, but the problems are recycled aggregate can be very, uh, very heavily contaminated, and recycled aggregate is an extraordinarily variable material. You don't know from loader scoop to loader scoop exactly what you've got in there, but, uh, but we managed to get it into the building code, and the big help here is the American Society for Testing Materials, ASTM, has a standard document C33 on aggregates, that standard document acknowledged recycled aggregate. We could uh, piggyback uh, on that one. The contractor proposes the use of the recycled aggregate. The uh, uh, licensed design professional and the local building official have to approve it. The building code essentially gives a, uh, a guidance for what the acceptance program, what sort of data would have to be uh, uh, presented to, uh, to gain uh, acceptance. Uh, essentially, the responsibility is on the user to demonstrate acceptable mechanical properties, durability properties, for the duration of the project, not just on the loader scoop that we sampled this morning. And then lastly, alternative uh, uh, cementing materials. Essentially, there are a wide range of cementing materials beyond mere Portland cement, which is essentially a calcium, silicon, aluminum, iron, and oxygen uh, uh, composite. So these are now into the, uh, uh, the building code. There are compliance requirements for all of our standard cements, plus there are uh, options uh, in the building code for our alternative uh, materials, which include what sort of evidence you have to prepare and how, str how much stronger that evidence is if you can point to its prior use in the same uh, environment. But a beautiful phrase that comes from our current building code commentary is as with all new technologies, a project owner should be informed of the risks and rewards. Now, to bring this back full circle to where uh, uh, Sasha began, the observation uh, that uh, a worker from the 1950s or 1930s would have no problem fitting into a similar construction gang in this current year. And in many other fields, Changes have been spectacular. The author of these words is uh, Adam Neville, uh, one of the most influential of all concrete uh, experts. He wrote the definitive work. He said, new materials are being developed and new uses for concrete are being found. An intelligent engineer or architect will be on the lookout for the possibilities. I think that's what we are doing here today. We are on the lookout for possibilities. And Adam Neville said, the time is come to leap forward. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Um, I'd like to invite the presenter to come up. Is this working? Yeah. We hit our time. <laughs> Oh, fun. <laughs> this isn't concrete. <laughs> um, thank you for the um, very provocative presentations um, and very well crafted, I have to say. Um, I, I definitely want to hear more because there's um, more to each of the presentations, but I'd like to maybe find a thread that, can, um, that all three presentations um, can address. And it's perhaps an area that, um, that we're not addressing today, actually, because um, given the short day, we couldn't fit everything in, but it is a question of um, conservation. Right. And uh, the question of conservation, I think, ties back to issues of like, dealing with what we got today of these buildings and structures, infrastructures, um, the actual physicality of the material. Um, but there's also a kind of cultural relationship to these building, auto, these built structures. And so what, how and what do we do or how do we engage these works? Um, but there's also there's a kind of sense of like a, a kind of collapse, both the physical building, but also the um, institutions and economies that goes with it, and as well as a kind of what kind of culture gets um, lifted or suppressed. So if um, any of you like to talk about that. Am I still mic'd? Yeah. Oh, you still? Yeah. Are we mic'd? Oh. Um, well, 
I, uh, we haven't developed that part of our research, although it will obviously come up. And one of the things to say is that the um, research in conservation labs on concrete is very advanced and, and customarily has the conversations between architects and engineers and material scientists. And those conversations are completely siloed, just like all the other conversations into their uh, so it would be a good idea to have that conversation across subdisciplines. Um, I, ha I have to say, as someone who knows a lot about the history of conservation, that I don't think that it should hold a special um, claim over the fate of the built environment. Conservation as a field, even in, in reinforced concrete, tends to be devoted to the special, to the bespoke. And so there's very many people involved, for example, in figuring out how to restore this very beautiful church de Rancy by Perret in Paris. And it's a worthy cause, but the, the solution they will develop will have to be transformed in order to become applicable. The other thing is that from the perspective of climate change and carbon sequestration, actually, um, you're going to have to say this better than I, but yeah. essentially, uh, concrete, if it doesn't fail through carbonation, um, begins to uh, sequester carbon. So. Of course, it's better not to have built it in the first place. <laughs> but sometimes destroying it is not the, the better sort of ecological option. Is that? Yeah. That's so right? technically, moving forward, how does our desire to conserve address our desire to also conserve like the longer time scale dynamics of climate change and, and large scale global challenges? Yeah, I mean, the question of, mind, of um, conservation, the way that I think of it uh, in terms of the methods of history that we mobilized to talk about concrete. Uh, and I think that definitely both of our presentations belong to this sort of genre that it's now getting quite a bit of traction in history of technology, which is to think about innovation in terms of maintenance, actually, sort of the history of maintenance that comes with innovative processes. Um, so how shocking the old can be. And I think that's kind of like the, the 100 cent years of, of concrete, um, which um, implies looking less you know, at the single expert designer that has the brilliant idea and then they start technological processes and technologies like concrete as a technology in use, no? which is constantly being reinvented, but is a maintenance of reinvention. So, because the maintenance, the, the conservation concept draws to this sort of larger theme in architectural history, which is about the monument and the, you know, how do you, um, yeah, conservation theories. But maintenance, history of technology as history of maintenance, I think it's sort of the realm within which we can start discussing concrete again as, uh, in terms of the single author, expert, and more in terms of the many other forces that, um, that think of technology in use, yeah. That's how I think of it. Yeah, uh, you know, thank you for the question. I was thinking about this emphasis we place on visiting these objects as students, as architects, and um, the pain we feel when they are destroyed. And a lot of concrete uh, modern architecture in India has been destroyed for different reasons, some of it in fires, some of it in other ways. And I think perhaps while we're talking about archiving, we need another way to archive this material, not just um, a kind of physical and tour, tour, the archive, you know, through a tour, but some sort of other way to think about the history of these that isn't necessarily just, you know, make a virtual gallery of it all. I don't, I don't know, it's somewhere there. And I'm just wondering how we can think about um, these buildings and the legacy of them in terms of how we remember them. Um, some way, I don't have an answer, but. In terms of legacy, I'm gonna, I have a question for you guys about conservation, and that is when you do prototypes, like we don't tend to conserve the history of the prototype. And one thing we haven't touched on in the, the name of the conference from lab to site is the fact that a lot of concrete, the lab is the site. And I mean, to see the chairs first presented at the site and then go back to the lab and they get crushed or the standards, right? The way they get put in places through all these tests, yet we kind of tend to focus on the conservation and the maintenance of the final structures. But how much is that actually related to the initial prototyping and the initial, which we don't necessarily think of as conserved in the same way, yet it has to be so that the knowledge is there, right, going forward, and whether it's in a standard or whether it's in um, presentations. Well, it, it kind of expands the notion of the archive, I would say. I mean, the, the building code is an, 
is an archive of, of procedures and, and standards that have been proven to, to work. Um, and in, this, in that same sense, the laboratory, I think, operates in a, in a similar way. I mean, we're kind of engaged in, uh, in sort of an absurd immediate effort of convert, uh, uh, con conservation because we're just trying to make things work so that they operate over a time span of, of a year or maybe a month or uh, just one experiment. And so to me, the, the, the question of, of time scales is, is also something that um, really unites these three presentations in, in different ways in, within that context of conservation. I was going to say that um, one of the greatest uh, revelations I had was that the thinness implies a time scale. This is what the carbonation equation does. As soon as you know how close the steel is to the atmosphere, that's how, mm. little, that's how short the lifespan is. Mm. And I had never before thought such an iconoclastic thought against thinness in concrete, which, as you know, you know thinness is the greatest value. Um, but there's this project in Moscow where uh, it's a, it was a constructivist building, not particularly elevated, but nevertheless very thin, which was conserved by OMA by putting just encasing it in more concrete. So the thin columns got thicker. And this also worked to protect the steel. I'm not recommending it, but I'm just saying that it's, it's indicative of the fact that form uh, carries lifespan, mm -hmm. carries lifespan limitations, and which also happened with your chairs. I thought about that with your chairs, which got thicker and <laughs> chunkier. Well, I mean, it, also, it also points to how efficiency is not necessary. Inefficiency is sometimes very helpful. That's right. Inefficiency lasts longer than efficiency. Yeah. 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 <laughs> But I think that one aspect of, um, of the maintenance question or the conservation question that it's kind of like think of, of the opposite of it, which is the failure of the concrete, because you're saying, you know, you have the codes that um, sort of secure some sort of conservation of the structures and provide risk for the public, but they come through multiple moments of failure, like the ones that you chose and the ones that run through all our presentations. Now the shells need to fall before they can just stand. I was very interested to hear that essentially what you're describing is a legacy of code, code innovations which get filtered into further codes, and that innovation there happens essentially through inheritance. It's not at all a break with the past. That new codes, that, let's say, new codes um, are able to bring in innovative techniques by borrowing from older codes. That's right. Yeah, it's a, it makes you want to develop strategies for dropping in little pieces of innovative code so that it can then, you know. yeah. yeah. In fact, uh, a line of thought that uh, actually developed as a result of preparing for this meeting and looking back on uh, how we were successful in getting new things into the ACI code, uh, it really caused me to recognize the, the need for organization with within the community that is dealing with that innovation. The organization among the aficionados of, uh, of new concrete and, and placing methods, because that has always preceded the adoption. The, uh, the building code people never thought up what's the best way to place concrete. The building code committees never thought up what's the best way to consolidate or cure or the recommendations for mixed design. It is consensus of the, uh, the users and the promoters of the innovation who then demonstrated that, and then the, the building code said, yes, this uh, looks like you guys have, have got this solved. So, so it looks to me, and I may be wrong, but right now, in some of the topics that we're talking about, we're still in this very, very heady, very exciting kind of wild west or, or wild east of, uh, of new ideas and innovations with, without bound, and this is the way it needs to be, but at some point, we need to think about how do we start focusing this into something that we can all agree with, that these are the fundamental principles of the way to do things if we really do want to promote this and so that the public can have confidence in our structures. And I, I do believe um, that the um, ACI actually has a committee on um, yes, 3D ACI printing. Yes, ACI just recently started a uh, committee on 3D printing. That's, uh, that on is cementitious materials. So that's, that's definitely a that's start a, for a key piece a of certain puzzle. kinds of innovation. Um, is there an American Concrete 3D Printing Association? An American? Um, concrete 3D Printing Association. There's an American Concrete Association. As a, as a kind of uh, I, organization. Maybe there is, but I, I'm not aware of that. 
Okay. Is there a 3D printing society? Sasha hanging out with his friends? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Basically. But you know, all these things start with hanging out with friends and colleagues and uh, folks that think differently than you do, and that, that generates uh, new ideas. That, that makes this an important conference. Yeah. Can you just add to this question of organization? Um, I'm, I'm thinking about like organization in order to keep producing innovation as the, new, as the normal. No? The normal is to keep innovating. Um, but with innovation comes failures, and that implies the risks that also run, I think, through all of the presentation. Now, what are the risks? And, and, and the question being, who, who's, um, who's supporting those risks? You know, whether the risks are physical in the case of debt laborers or economic in the case of the sort of construction companies going bankrupt. Like within these new organizations that are being put together with incredible minds to think forward, the risk is going to still operate somewhere or on to somebody. So I guess that the question of, you know, in our case, in my case, is the worker or the laborer, but who's incurring that risk? That risk is it economic, I assume, and are these institutions, these organizations um, carrying the risk? financially perhaps or otherwise, yeah. So I, I find it interesting that a lot of, um, especially seeing your work, Sasha, and all the failures and testing, and a lot of people here also in terms of the fabrication work is um, trying to figure out R&D, um, doing a lot of the prototyping, testing, um, and finding limits, understanding the parameters. So in, in the sense, who carries the risk more than just the engineers, but now maybe also other disciplines are taking on some of that risk and um, establishing standards and data for um, further research. But I think that might be a, a, new, a way to like um, lead into my next question, which actually has to do with the framing and the kind of the production of knowledge. Because mm -hmm. um, as we can see, there's definitely um, certain certain themes that keeps popping up as kind of in our consciousness now. And I'm, I'd like to maybe ask, like, what might be some areas that you're thinking that um, actually, based on this kind of sliding scale, um, where, where some of the gaps might, might need yeah. to be addressed? Well, a lot of this started for me um, because I, maybe I didn't clarify that I am actually not at all a concrete researcher. I do thermodynamics. Um, was with my colleague who is a concrete researcher and she does alkali activated cements and these are cements that don't have the huge amount of CO2 emitted when you create them and so there's a lot of really interesting knowledge in that domain and that's what we kind of refer to in some of these like she's way down in literally neutron beam scattering machines looking at like how the atoms form in there so that they know how they crack and this comes back to sort of the knowledge that Ken's talking about in terms of standards because one of her biggest challenges and our challenges and when we really want to innovate and make it so that I could ubiquitously deploy that type of concrete in this floor, in this building, mm. so that it doesn't fall down and it keeps us all safe, it's a huge task. And it requires a huge amount of research to provide the precedent that comes before all those standards get created. Um, and I think understanding how that knowledge navigates and actually come, come, brings us back to the risk question, in mm. fact, right? How do we decide the risk appetite we have, because I would argue in some cases she's faced with challenges where it's a little bit unfair, the, um, the expectation that you should be able to test a concrete that you've only developed in the last 10 years against concrete that has 100 years of empirical testing and evidence. Mm -hmm. And then there's sort of an expectation that you should be able to prove your stuff is as good as this stuff that has 100 years of data when you've only had 10 years to experiment mm -hmm. with it. Same could be said for, for 3D printing. How do you, you know, look at what happens in 10 years of layers that might delaminate, because you don't know, you don't have the time, and it's really difficult to understand how yeah. knowledge of, it can be done with, There's, accelerating testing can't always be the solution. Right, yeah. and, and the, this is, goes back to the difference between operating in a lab and on a site. The ubiquity of concrete actually sometimes works against the development of a consensus, precisely because the concrete paste might be a solution for a certain type of concrete which might be, get authorized for that, but not for its ubiquitous use. Um, in other uh, places. So that's a time scale that's pretty practical for this colleague. She cannot get tests made because no one, um, because she does not have pre-existing, it would take her 40 years, you know, her career would be over, <laughs> um, to make sure that that pace has, a, has the level of safety. This is very interesting, and I'm thinking that she perhaps needs to be a modernist again, 
<laughs> because I was thinking about the production of trust, no? How do we project that, that trust? And I'm thinking about your experts. They're saying, trust me, I'm the expert. I don't need 100 years or 150. These thin shells or these dams are going to save the nation. They did it rhetorically. They did it by their own embodiment, this efficiency. You know, they invented this idea of efficiency and expertise in ways that, you know, were mobilized and they were trusted. So there's these mechanisms that the, 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 these organizations have been able to you know, produce to um, make up no, for the lack of, of, of technical, perhaps, trust of, or otherwise. I, mean, I think the material science, this is why we included the history of material science. Material science is, a, on the one hand, highly multidisciplinary hmm. endeavor. On the other hand, has the effect of sequestering effect. Right. Um, Innovation expertise into very you know, instrumentally specific, yeah. scientifically specific, and thus subject to industry bullying. acceptance. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So as we said, it gets removed a little bit from architecture writ large and buildings and. Yeah. yeah. It's funny that you call her. You should meet her. No, I, I haven't. I think that she, if oh, she yeah. became a more a sort of. Um, yeah. um, you know, self-secured modernist, she might be able yeah. to come up with this. Yeah. Which, again, what I find interesting in putting all of these talks together is to identify that these mechanisms, the efficiency, the discourse, um, came at a cost of hiding other things. In our case, in particular, you know, the labor that just, you know, the, the fact that we don't talk about them, that they're not in the archives, even though they're in the photographs, and perhaps the fact that they continue to stay in the same stage, it's because they were hidden by design through these um, categories uh, of description of concrete. As, as you pointed out, they, uh, these, these procedures, they also come at a the, at the different type of cost, at, at the environmental cost, which then in turn might change uh, our precedents to begin with. I mean, precedents are deeply important uh, for us to generate that knowledge, but as you guys have demonstrated, uh, precedents will change because our, envi our environmental conditions will change at an ever accelerating speed. So we are trying to catch up with precedents, even if you were to build something now that uh, manages to withstand environmental issues or hazards today, th those will likely look different tomorrow. Yeah, what I was going to say is that um, the we um, of the we in the Anthropocene is changing. So one of the ways in which uh, anthropocenologists like us to think is that the risk is now spread across humanity and therefore this kind of tends to erase some of the barriers to uh, acting on environmental risk. Um, but in fact, it uh, shouldn't, so it, what we should do is choose the proper uh, precedents that are pertinent to certain we's. So the sign that you made, which I do want a copy of, yeah, totally. uh, would, be per <laughs> would be pertinent to certain we's. And basically, you made a sign for a passerby. You made a sign for like an urban dweller in this city or a city in the West. And that's not the same sign that you would make for somebody else who's maybe building their own home in their backyard or uh, you know, using concrete. Um, and I, I just want to put out there that that's perfectly within the thinking of the Anthropocene. Just because risk is, is spread globally across all humanity and creatures and buildings doesn't mean that one cannot therefore make choices and apportion you know, what is the proper precedent for this. Um, yeah, it's for really this where we depend on the knowledge that you're making by doing new tests and pushing new things out there. But we have to get the standards maybe faster. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> for some of these things like Alternative cementious materials. Well, I, in, in terms of speed, I, I think a lot of folks would automatically believe that it's the code writing and approving bodies that are the slow ones. That that was not the case in these, in these uh, most recent three examples. It was uh, getting enough information to demonstrate that uh, yes, we, we we can reliably. Uh, do this. So there, there is a maturation time that is required just for the development of the, of the technology. But on, on the issue of risk, one of the things that's interesting is the, uh, the, these new code provisions, I think they undeniably put more risk back on the building designer and on the local building official. Yeah. They're saying, okay, you, you can do this, but you have to develop the testing program, you have to do the quality assurance program. And uh, there may be some designers, and there certainly will be some contractors who will say, look, we, 
we're not, we don't want to buy into this, so we're not going to use the recycled aggregates. We're not going to use the alternative cement. Yeah. So I'd like to maybe open up uh, yeah. the uh, questions the for the audience. Yeah, um, exactly. We have a throw mic that I can uh, pass yeah. along. Yeah. Yeah. Any yeah. questions yeah. for yeah. the panel? Oh wow, it's a ah. patch. Look at that. That's it's, fun. <laughs> it's so weird. You can't hand it. It looks like it's. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much for the engaging presentation so far. It's been a great symposium, beginning from Mr. Barry yesterday to Ken's uh, very strong finish. Uh, my question is, uh, I, have, I have two questions. Uh, one is, uh, I'm curious if all of you, the panel have, if you guys have noticed a sen sort of sensitivity towards using fresh water. I know if the pH of the water is a certain amount in its purity, uh, the concrete strength is, it changes. So I'm curious if you've noticed in certain projects maybe perhaps you wouldn't need a certain strength of concrete if the industry has a sensitivity in using perhaps not the purest and cleanest water out there. And then my second question is perhaps mostly towards Forrest and Lucia and maybe Ken, um, how did galvanization uh, affect any of your research and how does it uh, help with the quality of concrete? Mm -hmm. um, well, to the first question about the purity of water, I'll just give an anecdote because, again, I'm not an expert and I would argue that probably there's some empirical evidence where people tested different water qualities. But historically, we found, and it's interesting, that they used salt water in concrete at one point because they thought it would help with the process, when in fact, later we very clearly understand that the salts make the rust happen very, very quickly. So uh, it's a big oops on some things. Um, so you learn, it's a good, just an example. Of my answer would be em empirical evidence is largely where a lot of these things are found. Um, and then leaping forward now to the actual material science, as we sort of discussed, so there probably is some also analytical analysis of how the interactions happen in the cement paste and with what pollutants, what other variations of the cash. I love that the substance is not a chemical compound, we just call it cash. Um, and the, the, the ability to mitigate that oxidation through galvanized steel, people use uh, stainless steel if they really want to prevent rust in their, in their structures or even I mean, completely alternative systems with post-tensioning and using alternative materials. There's a lot of pathways of innovation that avoid the rebar problem, which we didn't address in this talk. Um, and going forward, I think even, you can even electrify bridges, right? Cathodic protection is another way to passivate oxidation by running electricity through it. So there's a lot of innovation that's available to address this. I think what we're trying to say is we should be thinking about it um, in this broader uh, uh, context of we're all siloed in our, uh, kind, somewhat siloed in our, the material scientist, my friend Claire White, I should say her name at some oh, yeah, point, yeah. Claire White is in the lab making little vials of cement paste, right? And it's actually really hard to have this conversation with her about, to, to help her help teach me about whether carbonation matters and, and the fact that still 99.9% .9 of concrete is just standard rebar put into the concrete. And so how do we break out of the innovation in the, like very much in the lab and then kind of bring about a little bit of change, more in mentality maybe than necessarily um, in, some, in many cases than just in, in technical innovation. I mean, in the very specific case, the way you phrased it was, wouldn't pure water make stronger concrete? Um, and the answer is, I mean, I don't know, but in the case of Claire, she's working on denser paste, which makes for less water and stronger concrete. And although she's working on strength that also mitigates the carbonation we're talking about because remember the carbonation comes from the water that's anyways in concrete. It's not the water that's coming out there. If there's salt coming in, that makes it worse. Um, so literally the assumption that you made, which is that strength is a good thing and it comes from, you know, that it comes at the moment that the water's put in, that's one of the things one would have to work kind of against to mitigate, to mm. make slightly more subtle. And coming from me, who is definitely, just to be clear, not a concrete engineer at all. Uh, in, in regards to the, the water, spe standard specifications up until recently always said the water you use to, for concrete has to be potable. They could have said drinkable, but they said potable. But 
Recent changes have uh, actually permitted uh, a variety of, uh, of gray water sources to be used in making concrete and given, uh, given provisions for uh, uh, the conditions under which you can do that and what the chemical composition would be of that non-drinkable uh, water. A couple of the comments that were just made here re reminded me that there is an underlying economic reality to concrete construction which is absolutely the elephant in the room, and here's the best way I can explain it. A few years ago in the springtime, snow was receding, the glaciers were receding in Ithaca, so I went down to the Lowe's Garden Store, and I saw that they were getting everybody excited about getting back into the garden. And I saw about 50 pound bags of mix it up yourself concrete, 50 pounds of concrete, $2.89. I then walked on, and I saw 50 pound bags of horse manure for fertilizing your garden, $5.89. I then realized why we don't build bridges, highways, and buildings out of horse manure. We can't afford it. <laughs> We, we are looking at a material in bulk, which is about two and a half cents a pound. Go to Disneyland, fudge is $14 a pound. That we are operating on the basis of the cheapest material that we have found that will work. And our current state of the infrastructure has demonstrated that we cannot afford to fix it with the cheapest stuff that we've got. So as we think about uh, more interesting long-term life cycle pricing of a material which will have a higher first cost, we got to think about where, where that money is going to come from and who has to wake up and say we got to spend more when we build the bridge the first time. Yeah. 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 Is there another question? Thank I think you we have the... time for one more. <clears throat> Talks. Uh, I was wondering if um, concrete codes and standards have been hacked um, in any way. Um, and I'm kind of thinking of IKEA hacking and how early on the corporation tried to clamp down on that because of, I guess, copyright infringement. And then they realized that was foolish. And now they're supporting it. If you anticipate that happening in, in this industrial field or, um, or if it's already happened, uh, other question about this is a history of a specific technology, concrete. I wonder if there's anything to be said about brutalism. So I guess two questions. Brutalism. Wait, sorry, I didn't hear the question. Is it about, what's the question about? So brutalism? the hacking of the codes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, oh, hacking the codes. Like, yeah. And brutalism. Well, to to maybe to maybe speak about that. I think it, it's something that that happens. I don't know if it. Well, hacking is perhaps one way to describe it. You see some of these uh, 3D printed buildings that uh, only work as hybrid constructions. I think that's a, one could describe that as a way of, of hacking the code or somehow uh, interacting with the code that makes, makes it easier to get something implemented in an early stage. Um, so so perhaps, that, perhaps that happens. I'm not sure if it happens at, at the actual code writing level. Um, I mean, I... You want to hear about brutalism? I'll just say about hacking. The codes were unique to concrete. Codes were made by hacking, whereas many other materials like right. steel is you can empirically do deflection models of I beams and every beam and know exactly how it bends analytically. Concrete, all the codes originated for the majority of its existence out of empirical testing and formulations and water ratios, right? Yeah, no, but but I mean the industry plays a huge role. There's been concrete monopolies in the yeah. you know early 20th century. Each um, the reason we recognize these companies' names is because they conspired to have their patent uh, system, which came out of this experimental milieu, turned into basically monopolies. So yeah. we should also not sort of fetishize the. But I grew up on a farm in Iowa, and I saw farmers throwing all kinds of weird crap into concrete just to like make up space. So I mean that's also IKEA hacking maybe on the farm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so about brutalism, I don't, um, not a historian of brutalism, but there are people who are now correlating the supposed end of brutalism due to its ugliness to other things such as the energy regime change. So Luca Stanek has a nice paper on the end of brutalism. I, I don't know if he ever said it publicly in a paper, but I once had a conversation with him when he said, you know, I think that they stopped building brutalist buildings in the Middle East basically because the energy crisis produced that. Uh, which is a nice way to write against the 
the fantasy that brutalism is, you have to either be for it or against it, that it's a purely um, you know, fetish-driven uh, paradigm, etc. Can I add something, not to the brutalist, but to the code hacking? I think it's important to understand, or for me at least, uh, when I understood that the emergence of codes sort of came after or alongside the emergence of labor rights. So in many uh, ways, you know, the codes is a way, again, to divert the costs. Because of course, the material is very, uh, very cheap, but the labor can be very expensive, or not, depending on the level of labor rights that you have. Like, the, 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 literally the amount of workers that die on, on the site. Um, so to understand that as much as you're invested in code, you're also invested in um, sort of appending the dynamics on the site and, and the, the rights of workers, uh, I find that both go together. Um, so when you're hacking the code, you must be doing something also to the, um, to the social cost of, of concrete. So just to keep that, I think, in mind. It's critical to the invention, I think, yeah. I was wondering how hacking is defined in this context. Like, is it uh, abiding by the letter but not the spirit? Is, is that what hacking is, yeah. right? Because uh, then the question is that, yeah, how can you stay within the codes? But do, I, I think that that's what you mean. I'm just thinking about how, yeah, concrete is a material that because it's so connected to our um, bodies, you know, the thumb rule by which we make concrete, yeah. we're just constantly it's much more used on site than in the kind of more technical ways. I think really the question is how do we democratize maintenance? Like how do we take this knowledge and really make it something that everyone has because you maintain it in everyday level. Like how do mm. we, I don't know, that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. More than the academia or research. Yeah. So with that question, I think maybe we can um, continue with the next series of talks. Um, I want to Thank you, everyone, in this panel for a provocative presentation. So join me to thank them for the talk.